Um, up next, please join exhibition curator Rachel Saunders for a closer look at Harvard Art Museum's largest ever exhibition, Painting Edo, Japanese Art from the Feinberg Collection at the Harvard Art Museums. Uh, Painting Edo offers a window onto the supremely rich culture of Japanese, the Japan, Japan's early modern era and selected from the unparalleled collection of Robert S. and Betsy G. Feinberg, the more than 120 works in the exhibition connect visitors with a seminal moment in the history of Japan as the country settled into an era of peace under the warrior government of the shoguns and opened its doors to greater engagement from the outside world. Uh, though Harvard Art Museums is closed for now, you can visit this exhibition virtually through Google Arts and Culture. Rachel Saunders is the Abby Aldrich Rockefeller Curator of Asian Art in the Division of Asian and Mediterranean Art at the Harvard Art Museums. She is responsible for the Japanese collections at the museums. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Rachel Saunders for this virtual tour of Painting Edo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten. I'm just going to try sharing my screen now. All right. Well, thank you, Kirsten, for that introduction. And um, wow, a hard act to follow, I have to say. I'm so honored to, to be here with you this evening, um, taking part in uh, uh, Stream Fest. Um, as Kirsten said, my name is Rachel Saunders. I'm the curator of Japanese art at the Harvard Art Museums. And I'm also the co-curator with uh, Yukio Lippet, professor of Japanese art history of our current special exhibition, Painting Edo, Japanese art from the Feinberg collection. It's really wonderful to be here this evening as part of your stream fest and to be virtually gathered with so many people probably many more people than we usually be able to bring together at one time in the physical space of the Harvard Art Museum's galleries for a tour, which I guess is one of those Zoom silver linings. But it feels especially valuable to me to be able to come together like this in our continuing state or observing physical distance. I also want to say that I hope that this tour might provide a restorative moment in light of the essential and difficult work in overcoming structural racism ahead of us all. Painting Edo is the largest exhibition in the history of the museums and it opened on February 13th, 2020. It's now of course temporarily closed, but you can uh, visit its digital avatars through an online exhibition and several vi video tours on our webpage. In the galleries, we have over 120 works of art from Japan's early modern Edo period, which is usually designated 1615 to 1868, and which was named for the new shogunal capital of Edo, the city that we know today as Tokyo. While the exhibition does offer a history of early modern Japanese painting in 10 rich chapters, what was more important for us was to attempt to offer an immersive experience of seeing differently. Painting Edo is also a milestone moment in the sharing of a truly remarkable collection of early modern Japanese art. The paintings in the exhibition are drawn exclusively from the collection of Robert S. Feinberg and his wife, Betsy G. Feinberg. During the almost 50 years they have been collecting, the Feinbergs have always made a point of welcoming scholars and students from all over the world to study their growing collection. In an act of exceptional generosity, they have now promised their collection to the Harvard Art Museums, one of the largest and most significant gifts of art ever to be made to the university. And it's in part for this reason that the exhibition opens with this magnificent painting by Tani Buncho. Titled Grasses and Moon, this enormous window-like ink painting commemorates a harvest moon viewing party that took place on the banks of Edo's Sumida River on the 15th day of the eighth month 
just over 200 years ago in 1817, as recorded in the inscription here. On a beautiful night in mid-autumn, the 15th day of the eighth month, 1817, as I wandered the banks of the Sumida River, a clear moon shone as brilliantly as the sun. The scene is rendered in this true view painted seven days later. Viewing the harvest moon amidst convivial gatherings of friends is a venerable East Asian tradition marked by merrymaking, consumption of wine, composition of poetry, and associated with fellowship for the idea that no matter how far we may be separated from those dear to us, distance alone cannot prevent us all viewing the same moon in the same sky on that same evening. The radical proximity of the river reeds that rise just out of the very front of the picture plane, one of which rises up to just caress the edge of the moon, conveys a powerful sense of bareness. There are no figures painted here, but the vantage point conveys the essence of the experience of being at this gathering and places you, the viewer, on the riverbank, gazing up at the moon. Yet the inked image and the oversized painter's seal and the inscription weave this one specific occasion into a communal historical fabric of every other preceding moon viewing party so that not just this 1817 gathering, but also our own unique experience of this painting converges as a shared memory that echoes across centuries of human experience. Now by, 187, uh, by 1800, Edo was the largest city in the world, dwarfing contemporary London or Paris with more than a million inhabitants. Japan's early modern era brought an extraordinary wave of urbanization and innovation, stimulating an immense appetite for intellectual and pictorial culture. A dizzying array of painting schools and lineages was established to meet the demands of traditional aristocratic patrons, as well as the more newly affluent. In the 20th century, scholars have attempted to deal with the pictorial wealth of Edo painting by taxonomizing and evolving a comfortable model for dealing with this huge abundance through the use of scholarly categories and labels. But over time, this label, well, this model has been offering gradually diminishing returns. The nature of the Feinberg collection has made it possible for us to begin a re-examination of these categories and to present it instead, as far as possible, on its own terms. To do so, we return to Edo period conceptions of painterly lineage, since it was through membership of such school-like organizations, which mirrored the pervasive semi-feudal organization of the Japanese warrior household, that Edo period artists understood their own subjectivity. Is primary, primarily to these lineages to which we have looked in organizing the 10 chapters of the exhibition. Now its physical layout is designed to welcome and orient the newcomer to Edo art among a representative selection of paintings in an initial lineage gallery. But beyond this, there is no prescriptive route and the exhibition expands outwards from this central area in nine additional sections five of which we'll visit on our brief tour this evening. Now, the first of these sections is the floating world section of the exhibition. Now here, we encounter paintings that encapsulate not so much the new and closely regulated urban world of the military city of Edo as experienced by day by its inhabitants, but paintings of the new urban fantasy worlds that grew up as spaces for leisure and release within this city. These licensed pleasure quarters were effectively cities within cities where theaters, restaurants, and bordellos were located. It was here in these so-called floating worlds, or ukiyo in Japanese, that class restrictions could be temporarily relaxed. 
their celebrities were pictured as elegantly dressed fashion leaders painted against blank backgrounds that invite the viewer to supply the missing narrative, the who, the why, the where, increasing your sense of engagement with the fantasy pictured. Here, for example, we have a painting of a beautifully dressed woman sitting alone, leaning against some lacquer boxes. Her hair is pinned up in a complex style, style, and she casually wears several layers of beautifully decorated silk robes spilling around her. She holds in one hand a narrow slip of paper, the type of paper that was made specially for writing poems on. And in her other hand, she holds the tip of her writing brush pressed to her lips, as she seems to be thinking about what to write. Above her floats a poem written in two columns of Chinese characters. Thinking of you, compelled to compose a verse, under the lamplight, writing through the night of our lost years. Now it's not quite clear whether this is a poem from an absent lover to which she's about to respond, or whether this might in fact be her response in the moment before she brushes it on the paper. The poem plays with the trope of the absent lover, usually a scholar official posted to some distant region. But in fact, we can see that this beauty is not quite alone. An enormous carp with golden eyes swims in the lively water waters of her outermost robe, looking up at her. Now, such paintings of isolated figures evolved out of busy genre paintings, a bit like this one, in which many figures featured. Now, this is a pair of screens depicting the arrival of the first foreigners in Japan, the Portuguese, who arrived in 1543. A great deal of attention is given to details of the ship and its crew, as well as its cargo of exotic trading goods. And here we see the procession of the ship's captain into town with Japanese townspeople inside storefronts peering out at the foreigners with their pinkish complexions, their high noses, their extraordinary hats, and their fantastic baggy trousers. In the School of Cording section of the exhibition, we have works in the globally influential mode of colorful painting, often called Rinpa, produced by painters who followed in the footsteps of a 17th century painter named Ogata Korin. It was works like these that when they arrived in Europe in the late 19th century, spurred the development of movements like Art Nouveau, for example. School of Korin painting is distinctive for its extravagant use of beautiful mineral pigments and precious metals to expand delicate classical literary motifs into often impressively immersive new images. Now this pair of folding screens, for example, here, pictorializes flowering plants of the four seasons arranged from spring at the right, beginning with the yellow carrier rose and uh, moving on to peonies, which is about where we are now in New England, through to summer in the middle section here, to fall uh, and fall chrysanthemums, and then winter at the end here with Nandina and Narcissus. This pair of screens is wonderful because the artist has actually left us several notional paths through which to walk this virtual garden. And in the mind of the Edo period educated viewer, each plant would also have conjured up a whole range of seasonal poetic associations as they metaphorically walked through the garden. Now this remarkable screen here is one of my favorite objects in the entire exhibition. Again, the cutoff tops of the trees invite you to complete the picture in your mind's eye, transporting you to the grove and channeling your vision along an inward leading path. And the path, which you can see if you just follow my pointer here, sort of does this, is really quite remarkable because it conveys a sense of subtle depth, even in a painting which is executed upon a flattening, reflective surface of gold foil. And while the painting style is not what we would describe as botanically realistic, again, we find the essence of the plant captured. For example, here in the top left corner of the, of the screen, there are two tiny leaves that just seem to flicker at the corner of your vision. And here, in the lichen-like texture of the tree trunks, which has been produced 
by dripping wet ink into wet ink. There are two sections in the exhibition devoted to supposedly amateur painting in the mode of the scholarly gentleman who painted not for money, but as part of a lifestyle that shunned the benefits and comforts of the mercantile world for the integrity of reclusion away from the world. These men, often called literati, would instead devote their time entirely to self-cultivation through reading, writing poetry, practicing calligraphy and painting. As amateurs, their materials were modest, usually just ink and paper, and their subjects, Chinese landscapes and symbolic plants, for example, were ideal for contemplation. Their paintings were not officially for sale, instead circulated as gifts between friends. Now, this is a mode of painting with a long and idealized history in China, but which didn't really take off in Japan until much later, in part because of differences in the, in the way society was organized in Japan. But scholarly ink painting, which is often called literati painting, was enthusiastically taken up more as a painting style than as an integral part of a reclusive scholarly life in Edo, Japan. In the 18th century, figures such as Uragami Shunkin, the painter of this magnificent pair of screens here, uh, integrated Chinese style brushwork and subject matter, like these almost extraterrestrial rocks, into Japanese formats, like the large folding screen. Titled Precipitous Rocks and Rushing Water, the rocks here tower over the viewer, who would in Edo Japan have been seated on the floor on tatami matting at the same level as the screens. What's wonderful here is that the water appears to be placid and tame, and it's in fact the rocks that are cresting and almost overwhelming the viewer. By contrast, next to Shunkin's screens right here, we installed two paintings by his father, Uragami Gyokudo. Now, while Shunkin's screen landscape is monumental, his father painted entire microcosmic landscapes in these tiny works. If we take a very close look, we can see from the quality of the ink on the paper how he used a fairly dry brush and moved it at different speeds and pressures across the paper in what is almost a frenzied mash of brushstrokes to create a mountainous landscape that seems to almost shimmer. Here, we have bamboo and trees, and we can actually even make out the thatch roofs of some cottages in this thicket. And although the dimensions are very different and you rather fall into this tiny landscape, as opposed to being swallowed up by the screens, they do have something in common. In that the element that you would expect to be moving is still, and the element you would expect to be still is moving. In this case, it's the solitary traveler down here in the bottom left-hand corner who's standing on the bridge, holding his walking staff, and he's your guide to entering this landscape, but he counterintuitively seems to be still while the landscape moves around him. As time went on and markets expanded, professional painters painting in exchange for money began to produce literati style subjects on commission as professional amateurs, if you will. They began depicting domestic Japanese landscapes and adding color and precious metals to these very popular works. As is the case in this pair of screens by the painter Yamamoto Baitsu, depicting two famous Japanese beauty spots near the city of Kyoto. On the right, we have Arashiyama, which is famous for its riverside cherry blossoms in spring. And on the left, we have Mount Takao, which was famous for its autumn maples. While the sites had been celebrated as timeless beauty spots in Japanese poetry for centuries, Edo period painters like Baitsu began to invest them with realistic and contemporary vignettes, something like this. So here we get to see these, this group of scholarly men enjoying an outdoor picnic together and nearby, a little attendant who's busy collecting mushrooms. The final gallery of the exhibition is devoted to fan paintings, which are represented unusually strongly in the Feinberg collection. And as you can see, there are folding fans on ribs in this gallery, uh, which were used as elegant accessories for cooling oneself and as gifts and in dances and rituals of various kinds. And particularly precious fan paintings might be removed from these ribs and preserved as hanging scroll format paintings, as you can see here. 
We also have fan paintings that were uh, never destined for utilitarian use. They remain flat so that they could be pasted onto decorative folding screens resembling this traditional floating fan composition. Now on the wall, we arranged two sets of fans painted with seasonal flowering plots together in an arrangement running from right to left, spring to winter, in a contemporary analog of traditional floating fan compositions. Now the floating fan format is rumored to have had its origins in the practice of gathering on a bridge to celebrate the end of the heavy heat of summer and the relief of the beginning of autumn by elegantly disposing of one summer fan by tossing it from the bridge so that these beautiful objects might float away together on the river below in an exquisitely poignant cluster. Thank you for joining me today on this virtual tour. I hope it's given you at least a taste of the ways in which these paintings both reflected and constructed Edo for their contemporary viewers and which continue to influence and alter and enhance our vision today. We at the Harvard Art Museums look forward to welcoming you back in person. And in the meantime, please do keep a lookout for new online content on our webpage to help you access the museums from home. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Rachel. And uh, thank you to the Harvard Art Museums for that virtual tour of the Painting Edo exhibition.